may have recycled all of the wrapping paper and finished up the leftovers and are starting to think about taking down Christmas decorations. But as far as the Christian calendar is concerned, this is the Christmas season. It's the 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany, which is January 6th. Uh, that's when you get the calling birds and the French hens and all the drummers and such. Uh, we will be observing Epiphany next Sunday, January 5th, uh, here at Creekside. We have been getting ready for the birth of Jesus, including the celebration that we had here on Christmas Eve, but there's still more to that story. Only the Gospels of Matthew and Luke include accounts of Jesus' birth. I've already noted this season that they include different details from that story. Luke tells us about an angel that appeared to Mary to tell her that she was going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew, only in Matthew, an angel comes to Joseph in a dream at night to tell him not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. Only Luke has shepherds and angels on Christmas night, and only Matthew has the arrival of the three kings, the magi, who come to the stable. Now, for most of us, we kind of refer to both of those accounts. They play well together and coexist peacefully. We invite all of those characters into our nativity sets, even though they do not all appear in any single account in the Bible. But after Jesus' birth, Luke and Matthew have fairly divergent accounts of what happens. In Luke, Mary and Joseph take their young son to the temple when he's eight days old to have him dedicated. And they meet a couple of old folks there, Anna and Simeon, faithful people who have been waiting for the birth of the Messiah and can finally depart in peace now that they have seen him. And then Jesus goes back to the area of Galilee, the town of Nazareth, and grows up. Matthew has a different account. And it's much more difficult to incorporate into our Christmas celebrations. But it's still part of the story. And I believe part of the difficulty is what makes it, makes it significant and why I want to look at it more closely this morning. Before we go to Matthew, I want to tell you a different story by way of framing this. I hope you can agree with me with the folk wisdom that there are two sides to every story. Probably more, be more accurate to say there are at least two sides to every story. There was a rabbi who came home from his day in the synagogue office, and his wife said, how was your day, dear? He said, oh, it was not good. The Goldsteins are fighting. Mrs. Goldstein came into the office today and talked all morning about the terrible things her husband is doing. And I said, you know, you're right. That sounds terrible. And then that afternoon, Mr. Goldstein called me and talked for two hours and told me all about his wife and the terrible things that she's doing. And I said, you know, you're right. That sounds terrible. And his wife said, what are you doing? You can't tell both of them that they're right. And he said, you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> what we hear in Matthew is the other side of the Christmas story. I believe it's a side of the story we need to hear because it's a story which is part of our stories, whether we want it or not. Our text begins in Matthew chapter 2, after the visit of the wise men. Chapter 2, verse 13 says, after they had left, and that they is the wise men. You'll remember that the wise men's first stop in the area was in Jerusalem, a couple miles away from Bethlehem. 
at the palace of Herod, who was the Jewish puppet king of the Roman Empire. The wise men innocently show up looking for a baby boy who is born king of the Jews, and they unwittingly set a tragedy in motion. They find the baby Jesus, pay him homage, leave their gifts, and then they go home by another way, bypassing Jerusalem. Herod is desperate to find this child so he can kill him. Murder in royal families and political appointments is not uncommon. It is especially common among the Herods. But this one takes a particularly ugly turn because Herod doesn't know which baby it is or exactly when he was born. So Herod orders every baby boy in Bethlehem under the age of two to be killed. An angel of God has already warned Joseph to take his family and flee to Egypt. And fortunately for us, Joseph was a man who listened to angels, even if it meant gathering up his family in the middle of the night. But what about those families left in Bethlehem? They didn't get any warning. They didn't have a chance to flee to safety, and their innocent sons were killed. What is that grief and agony doing in the middle of our lovely Christmas story? And here's an answer. I doubt if you will find this satisfactory, because I don't. The story of the death of those baby boys is in the Christmas story because it's true. It's horrific, it's painful, we don't want to hear it, and it's true. And if we're honest, we know it's true because we have seen it happen. Perhaps it's even happened to us. Maybe not literally the death of a baby boy, but the death of a child of any age, or other losses which are too profound for us to imagine or make sense of. Sometimes these things have happened at Christmas time, but even if they didn't, there are memories tied to our Christmas celebrations. Matthew does not give us any interpretation of the killing of these babies. He just tells the story. This isn't the first time Jewish boys have been killed. You'll remember Pharaoh's treatment of the Hebrews back in Egypt in the Old Testament. And it won't be the last time, if you know your world history at all. Matthew doesn't linger on the pain, although other authors have spun stories off from his account. Matthew lets us figure out how to deal with it. And maybe we never will go. What's true about this story is in the midst of the most wonderful and transcendent parts of our life, the coming of Jesus Christ, God with us, our Savior, those things <coughs> coexist with pain and despair. And sometimes with pain and despair that's great enough that we do not know how we will go on. If bad things have to happen, we really rather they happen to somebody else. Of course we would. None of those families who were left in Bethlehem deserved what happened to them. They weren't sinners any worse than any other sinners. God didn't need a host of baby boy angels. It was not God's will. Herod was a power-hungry, paranoid ruler who didn't care about the Jewish people at all. 
He knew they hated him because he was being used by the Roman Empire, but he was willing to do whatever it took to stay in power. And God did not strike him down for that terrible act of having those baby boys killed. Herod, we know from the historical record, did not pass away until six years later. And it was only then that Mary and Joseph felt safe to bring their baby back to Galilee. I do not know why God allows evil to exist or heart disease or auto accidents or cancer. But to deny that these things exist is futile. This is the world we live in. This is the story which we have been given. And for me, Matthew's account of the killing of the baby boys in Bethlehem is confirmation that Jesus was human. Were it not for the intervention of an angel and Joseph's quick response, <coughs> Jesus could well have been killed by Herod. Later in the story of Jesus, we know that there will be a political execution, and Jesus will choose not to call on God's angels to save him. This is an early chapter in a story which doesn't pull any punches. Jesus will be killed intentionally and painfully, and God will allow it to happen. Of course, we know the other side of that part of the story. Jesus' death was the key which unlocked the power of sin and death. And Jesus' death is the pathway to forgiveness and redemption. That baby that Mary delivered will be delivered into the hands of evil doers. And his death will deliver us from sin. We know Jesus' story, but we don't know the other side of our own stories. I understand that if you are in the midst of despair, no sermon will take that away from you. That is not the purpose of this sermon. I'm not here to dismiss the pain of those Bethlehem families or to say that they just need to get over it and move on. But there's always more to the story. God is not finished. And if we're fortunate and we're willing to let them in, there are people for us who can simply be present, who can listen and not tell us how we ought to be feeling or what we ought to be doing, who can just sit and listen and minister to us and be the hands and feet of Christ. It may not be the joyful fanfare of Christmas Eve, but it is an inseparable part of the Christmas story. It isn't a sanitized story. It's a true story that acknowledges that sometimes terrible things happen and we're powerless to stop. Next week, we'll circle back to Bethlehem and the arrival of the wise men. This is a happier part of the story before we hear the weeping of those mothers in Bethlehem. I believe it is the right thing to do for us to celebrate the joyful parts of the story when we have the opportunity to do that and to celebrate with gusto when we can. And I have it on good authority that there are going to be some pretty good cakes out here for our fellowship tonight, next week. But if life were only celebration, it would not be authentic. Every day is not Christmas. Some days of our lives is, some days the truth of our lives is painful, even during Christmas, especially during Christmas. But let me remind you, Emmanuel, 
God with us is still with us. God is not finished with our stories. The body of Christ is here to care for its members. There is still another side to the story. May God bless you and keep you.